Welcome to this evening's webinar on Windows and Doors and uh, how to install Windows and Doors. I'm really pleased to have Bill Butcher and Chris Herring of Green Building Store this evening to, to talk to us. So for the first few minutes, I'm just going to do a welcome and an introduction. Then I'm handing over to Bill and Chris to talk, to, to give their presentation. After about 50 minutes, uh, we'll move on to the question and answer session. So please put your questions to us through the Q&A and we'll be really pleased to have a discussion and answer that, that some of those questions. At about 20 past seven, I'll start to wrap up with the second poll and some information about next events and we'll aim to close at half past seven. For those of you who don't much know much about Cumbria Action for Sustainability, um, our vision is a zero carbon Cumbria and we do lots of projects relating to, to sustainability and, and zero carbon, not just retrofitting homes. So please have a look at the website and please you know, see what we've, what we've been up to. One of the key things that we are doing at the moment is our carbon literacy courses. And these are two half day sessions online. Uh, and we've got another course coming up on the 27th of April. Um, and we do them, we organize courses for um, organizations, communities, as well as individuals. So if that might be interesting for you and you want to get the whole picture, perhaps your carbon footprint and learn more about that, then that's something else that we do and, and you can get in touch with us about it. Within the energy service team, which is where I work, we have a range of free and pay for services. So we have free services for people in Cumbria who are eligible for our free help. And we have some short advice calls and retrofit consultations, initial consultations, which are free. So you can contact us for those. And of course, we have our paid for services. The main um, advice that we offer is our home retrofit planner, which is an energy audit service. And we tend to do thermal imaging in the winter as well. And of course, we run courses and webinars like this one. Um, we're happy to say this one's free because um, it's funded by the Energy Redress Scheme. Um, but we're really delighted Those some of you have donated when you book onto our courses and we're really grateful for that because it means we can do with more with what we've got. Okay, so I'd really like to start next to, to introduce Bill Butcher and Chris Herring. So Bill has done so many uh, different things. It's quite a long list, but um, a small summary, a number of really interesting low, low energy builds and retrofits including Denby Dale, Gold Car and Kirkburn Passive Houses, Sturley Farm, Enerfit Project. Um, Bill started out um, as a quantity surveyor and has very extensive experience in real world building projects. Set up the Green Building Store in 1995 um, and been offering consultancy on projects since then. And as a passive house consultant, and um, ACB member and Passive House Trust. So huge wealth of experience um, to bring to this today. Chris likewise um, has been involved in this, this for quite a long time <laughs> and, <laughs> and knows a huge amount of which we're going to benefit a little, a little tiny bit today. Um, so again, working on the Denbydale Passive House project and other passive house um, work as well. Uh, and of the involvement in the AECB too, and, and working on broader things like the Kirkley's Climate Commission. So again, quite a diverse range of interests and expertise. So I will now hand over to you and... Uh, okay, go. Thank thanks Tina um after that so it can only go downhill from there can't it <laughs> the way you've picked, just picked us up um I just need to uh sorry uh oh, where are we let's just can't yeah. quite, um take the mouse right up to the top it seems to be a little bit slow in the middle put, put your mouse in the middle at the top of the screen and, no, uh, hide and it should ah, there we are sorry sure. yeah yeah sorry I couldn't see it it was obscured by yeah, it's a special feature of Zoom to make it difficult. It is, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, we'll take it from here. So, 
what we're talking about tonight, and I'm aware that some some people will have uh, been to Diane's talk, and which I haven't seen, but I know Diane's work, so I know she's you know she's very thorough and very solid. But some won't, and then again, of course, we saw the poll, so some of you uh, have a good level level of knowledge. So, um, like Tina says, I'm hoping that everybody will take something out of this about this presentation. Um, so it's knowing where to start, really. Um, oh, there we are, moving. There we are. So what we what we we're doing, and and we do this a similar talk in differently structured, uh, quite often. Um, I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about theory, really, and not but not too much because I know you've had some of that, and some of you are knowledgeable, but some won't be so knowledgeable. And I think that base theory is very important in understanding the practice. So I'm going to do that, and then I'm kind of going to more or less hand over to Bill and we'll probably heckle each other a little bit. We do that sometimes. Um, and Bill's going to talk about some case studies and sort of theory and practice, particularly in retrofit, which is I think what we're really interested in. So I hope that's going to make sense. If the first bit seems, well, I know all of this, well, we'll come to the second bit where it will be applied anyway. Um, so just to, to start off with Windows, obviously Windows, how difficult can they be? Um, and basically they are pretty what a very significant part of any build or any retrofit. The, the way we use Windows, obviously, we're designing a new build. Um, the challenges are quite particular. Um, and obviously there we're designing for a high level of complexity in Windows. Um, they do so many things, if you like. I won't linger on this. Um, but, you know, they if we're designing a building, they literally can make a difference in the, the, of the appearance of the building, the... the, the um, determine how we live in the building, what it feels like to live in, which in the end is probably the most important thing for all of us, you know, actually being in the building, but also the aesthetics of the building and the function of the building. So very important. I wanted to start here because now, you know, some of you may have a good understanding of Passive House, some might have very little, but in a way our journey started, or in many ways it started with Passive House. It's, it's the, the discipline that has really driven us to do both new build and retrofit to very high standards. And it's where really we've learnt more than anything else about how to make buildings work. So if you know all of this, sorry, but uh, I'm going to just have a quick rattle through why this matters so much. And I think the context should be helpful. Um, the importance of Passive House, of course, is it's a, a rigorous standard for energy efficiency and comfort. comfort. It's an exemplary standard for best practice, and it's exemplary for retrofit as well. We may not need to go to that standard for retrofit, but it, it certainly gives, tells us where we can go, and it delivers performance. Um, and it leads us to high standards of design, particularly new build, obviously, and construction. And interestingly, in many ways, it illustrates what gives us best value in terms of getting energy efficiency and comfort out of the building. This picture, if anybody doesn't know it, is the very first passive house uh, near Frankfurt, uh, built in 1991. So just again, what is it? Um, and the difference really is uh, most of our houses, we keep some degree semblance of comfort through active um, input of energy. So, you know, we can take the example of the the coffee, uh, coffee machine where we keep keeping the coffee warm all the time. And obviously it's much better if we have a super insulated vacuum flask that we keep our coffee in where it stays warm without needing to put any energy in. And that's the fundamental, that's what we're doing. Most of our houses are active. We have to heat them to make ourselves comfortable in the passive house. We don't have to heat very much. We save the energy. So just to very quick recap of what we need to do to get high levels of performance in a building. And the first, the obvious first thing is we need a continuous blanket of insulation over the whole thermal envelope. And obviously in a passive house, it will be much thicker than current building regulations. Uh, these are generic slides. So, but in retrofit, obviously we'll be looking at what is feasible, depending on whether we're externally or internally insulating. Uh, it's very important once we start insulating to think about thermal bridges and we aren't driven to do this sufficiently with our current building regulations and certainly for retrofitting people often virtually ignore thermal bridges but we really need to be thinking about that because as you insulate the thermal bridges become very can become very significant and also almost waste the effect of that insulation so they become important that we understand where our thermal bridges are and the thermal bridge if anybody doesn't understand that is 
uh, anything that's going through the insulation, which is carrying uh, heat energy from the inside to the outside, or where the insulation thins down or disappears. In fact, places like the eaves or where the walls meet the floor, those sort of areas are particularly uh, difficult to get continuity. Um, and we need a lot of attention to detail, and that's just the same in retrofit. We need to be very much aware of these things. We need air tightness, and I'm sure probably most people are aware that air tightness is as significant as insulation. You need, you need to be thinking about where our air tightness layer is. So when we're working in retrofit, of course, it's very challenging. Um, and I live in a sort of semi semi converted house, so you know I know how challenging challenging it is. But um, we are aiming to get that air tightness down, certainly commensurate with the level of insulation. And we use we're using purpose design tapes and, and, and possibly membranes to get that level of air tightness. We'll talk a bit more about that. Yeah, yeah. we'll be coming back to all of this in the context of what we actually do and the windows. So I'm, I'm just whizzing through this, if you like. Um, and just putting air tightness in context, um, and if we look at these two, um, here on the left, we have our typical new build house in the UK which has the equivalent leakage approximately of a hole in a wall machine. And in a passive house, we're looking at about the leakage of a, a credit card equivalent hole. So that's the, if you imagine, completely airtight envelope, and that would be the equivalent amount of leakage. Interestingly, our leaky old homes might typically have the equivalent of two hole in the wall machines to allow, allow air through the fabric of the building. So it becomes very, very important, um, very significant. We, in a passive house, we need triple glazed windows, and we would often advocate triple glazed windows in a retrofit, depending on what level it's going to. Um, you do that not only for energy efficiency, but also for comfort. And I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, so we're looking at, we'll be, this is what we're going to be looking at, the detailing of how we install, et cetera. So I won't, I won't uh, dwell on that. And then we do need to think about ventilation. And if you are doing retrofit, it's a very important factor to think about. We may not be going to uh, mechanical ventilation with heat recovery, it's certainly what we need for a passive house, for high performance new buildings, but we do need to be thinking about mechanical ventilation because frankly, what's, called, what's deemed natural ventilation doesn't really work. And so this is an important part, particularly as we start improving the air tightness. Uh, typical MDHR system we'd use in a passive house or in a high quality retrofit. And I noticed Tina's house has, has an MDHR system in it. We were talking to her so in her retrofit. There's also MEV, Chris, isn't there? There's also MEV, but we need a mechanical system. This thing, whether it's yeah. mechanical extract ventilation or MDHR. Yeah, that's right. Um, just a reminder with windows that they are very different from the rest of the fabric of the building. But this is actually an example of the energy balance for the first passive house that you saw a picture of earlier, but it doesn't really matter. Any building would be not dissimilar. And if you look at this, first of all, the windows are in, in this particular building with 50% of the total losses because the new value of the window is much worse than any wall, if you like. Even a triple glazed window. The triple glazed windows are a lot worse than any insulated wall. So I should say insulated wall. Um, and, and yet um, the area of the window is quite small. So it's, it's the weakest point in the fabric of the building normally, in any building that you're insulating to a reasonable level. And yet it's also the place where we get solar gains and in a passive house, we might be finding they're typically imbalanced. So the important thing is that we're getting losses and gains and being aware of that in terms of that total balance. I said I'd just mentioned comfort and discomfort. Um, and it's something to be borne in mind, even in retrofit, that um, if we're using typical double glazing, uh, when it's cold outside, we'll have a quite a, a relatively cold surface on the inside. That will be giving you a sense of radiant cool to your body. Um, and we are very sensitive to radiant, radiant temperature. Um, and we will compensate by putting up the temperature in the room, the air temperature to compensate. Um, so we're, we're, we're doing something quite poorly, and then we're compensating by putting heat in. So much better to have a warm surface, as we would here. Um, with triple glazing, we'll have a warmer surface on the inside when it's cold on the outside. We don't need to put the heat, the heat, the air temperature up to compensate. So we're saving energy and we're increasing comfort at the same time. 
So just a little context in terms of why triple glazing is often worth considering. There we are. Um, and it just gives you a, an idea of what this looks like. Uh, passive house, very well insulated with a thermographic image. So the warm colours are, are the warmer surfaces. Um, and as compared with typical double glazing, you've got a lot more colder surfaces when it's cold outside. In this case, this particular slides were at minus five outside. It just gives you a sort of visual image of that, really. And when we are thinking about passive house windows, and I'm going to stop talking about passive house now, but this is where we've cut our teeth, really, um, in many ways. We are thinking about the energy losses, but we are also thinking about comfort. And we're thinking about what is passive house terminology is called hygiene. What it actually means is condensation risk on windows. We don't want lots of condensation on windows because we'll get mold growth. So we need to be really thinking about that. And that will apply to retrofit as well. And a sort of final context, really. New builders, obviously, uh, standards are predicted to go up. I mean, whether they go up in reality because of the performance gap is, is questionable. But nevertheless, standards are going up. Where is retrofit going? Um, and that's an interesting question. How far do we need to go? And I'm sure it's one that, well, everybody who's doing retrofit is wrestling with to some extent. I'm just really putting this in this context. Um, and um, if we're looking at the future home standard, which is 2025 standard, so far, the government has been flagging that they're looking at triple glazing actually for that. So that's worth bearing in mind when you're doing your retrofit, what standards are we moving to? And if you do want to understand more about what is, what, where we should be going in terms of retrofit, if you're interested in sort of policy and, and where we should be going, this, this is actually a webinar tomorrow night. Uh, I'm going to put the link in at the end as well, so you can sort of the slide will be up for a bit longer. Uh, it's an Insulate Britain and ACB combined webinar looking at where we should be going, modelling where um, UK uh, over the next few years and, and really how far we need to go with retrofit. Um, and has called it Deep Retrofit is Dead, Long Live Deep Retrofit. And if you can get your head around that one, but uh, it will be an interesting webinar. Um, so just flagging that up. Right, so some quick principles. I'm going to be very quick with this. I think probably people know this, but fundamentally we've got heat loss through glazing, heat loss through the frame. Um, we've got heat loss dribbled to the edge of the glazing, and we've got heat loss dribbled to installation. And if we put all that together to get us uh, a U value for the window, we put together the heat loss through the glazing, the frame and the uh, edge of the glazed, glazing. Uh, that is how we find the uh, U value of the window, the thermal loss of the window. What's interesting though is the, again, learning from the, the passive house example, they include in the installation. And we don't do that in our methodology in the UK. We kind of combine that into the wall and you don't notice it. But the window installed value is critical to understanding the performance of the window. And this is a really important point. It's not included in the uh, BSE M1007, which is the standard for calculation of U values, but it is critically important to understanding how your window is performing. And that applies to retrofit as well. So th this is a critical bit of information really. And the way it's the importance of learning from passive house, um, I talked about the energy balance, and of course there is an energy balance because we've got a certain amount of sun hitting the window and getting through, um, and that is, that is the G value. I'm sure people are aware of G value. Um, and, don't to worry about that. and we have an energy balance, of course, where the sun's coming in and the heat's loss, and there may be some loss through air leakage as well, um, as we ref I referred to earlier. Window frames, um, so this quick whiz through, but window frames are very important to think about because they're the weak point. The glazing, you, you're getting solar gain, you're getting a gain as well as a loss. Um, and, you know, whereas with insulating walls, maybe it's quite high standards, and our frames are a 75 millimeter piece of either PVC or timber, whatever we make them from. Um, so we want to minimize the frame area. It's nice to get it down as thin as we can. We may insulate it as well. It's important to be thinking about that because the frames are really a weak area and if possible we want to be getting insulation onto the frames to, to minimize that loss. It's important to think about the thickness of frames as well because if we have a thinner frame we'll get more glass area, potentially we're getting more solar gain as well and typically that would be about, in this case about 15% in this particular example but um, 
it, it really makes a difference to performance. And if we think about the performance of windows and in the UK building regulations, these windows are the same, um, but in reality, if we model them properly um, and we look at the results, this window on the right here, this fixed light has a U-value of 0.85, uh, almost a pass window, triple glaze, nice triple glaze window. Uh, if we um, add all these bars and little fan lights and so on, um, our, um, uh, we're assuming they're both well installed, so we're ignoring the installation value. Um, the new value you can see is 1.25, it's a lot worse just by having all those bars and, and all of that detail. So can we simplify is the question. Um, not only that, but if we just moving through this slide, a simpler window is cheaper. So do you need all those fan lights? Do you need those glazing bars? Can you do it sim more simply? If you've got a ventilation system in, perhaps you don't need fan lights. Those sorts of questions. Um, and you know, here are the differences, if you like. So a house here with these have been stuck on glazing, glazing bars, probably. Um, I, think, I think there are windows, so yes, there will be. Yeah, there are. Are opening lights. Sorry. Yeah. There are our windows, Chris. There are there. Uh, yeah. And, yeah. So they're stick on, it sounds horrible, right. like, on glazing bars, but they're, they're actually quite very neat. They're very neat, but they're cutting out light. They're cutting out, cutting out light. light. And the, the, the heavier members are also um, reducing the performance of the window through, um, as I say, the frame is poorer than glass. So the frame, more frame means more heat loss. So you, you can use a simpler window, then you're basically going to be cheaper and it's also going to be more efficient. So just think about that design, even on the retrofit. The new build, even more important to think about, because you've got more flexibility, but on the retrofit, think about that. You've always got less room for manoeuvre with listed buildings, of course. Yeah, we'll not go to listed buildings, because it's, uh, <laughs> yeah. it's a whole yeah. other world. And conservation right? areas. Conservation areas, listed buildings, yeah. It's yeah. a big issue, yeah, that's right. But again, if you're aware of these issues and you're aware, can we simplify, you know, that, that's an important step. And yeah. can get better value and better performance. Now, just while we're talking about frames, um, this is a principle Bill's going to talk about a lot more. So I'm just sort of starting us off here, really. Um, if we've got, if we're insulating on the outside, um, we're going to probably be insulating on the outside or the inside, obviously, unless we're just filling a cavity, but um, then obviously our insulation wants to come around onto the frame, remembering that the frame is a, is poor, it's a it's a, a poor insulator, if you like, whether it's new PVC, whether it's timber, whatever it's made of, compared with the with an insulated wall, compared with the glazing, it's poor. So we want to bring the insulation round to reduce the heat loss through the frame and to improve that installation side value if we can. So if it's an if it's an externally insulated wall. We want probably want an in, inward opening window because the window of the frame is obviously wider on the outside, and the exact reverse if we're using IWI insulating on the inside, if we can. So it's something to be very firmly borne in mind. And Bill's going to be coming back to that, so I'm just flagging it at this point. Um, so some more principles around installation. Um, installation is critical to achieving good overall window performance, and I'm just going to be looking at that in a moment. We, also, we need to give attention to the thermal bridging. It's absolutely essential. And by uh, working with installed window U values, it gives us a really clear idea of where we are. And we need to think about air tightness. And we're thinking about cost effectiveness. We buy an expensive window and install it badly. We lose a lot of the, the benefits. We've just paid for a 0.8 window and we lose that. And we'll see that in a moment. I'm going to give some examples of that. So first of all, Back to these pesky side values, it finds us a bit tricky. Um, so when we install a window, what we're looking at is a uh, graphic here. Um, we take the heat loss calculated through window wall combination. And if we take everything away, so we take the window away and we take what we're left with is basically a, a certain amount of heat loss attributable to the perimeter of the window. That is the side value of the window. And this is some work done by um, Bob Lowe, who was a, 
uh, was at Leeds Beckett University at one time, Professor Bob Lowe, uh, some years ago on a double glazed window, so we're not just focusing on triple, uh, showing the side value, depending where you put the window in a, in a cavity wall. So just model that and the difference in side value by moving the window into the insulation, further into the insulation, and then putting it into the inner leaf. So outer leaf, inner leaf, or in the insulation. And you can see that this side value here this becomes quite significant. And we'll see the kind of significance of these higher side values in a moment. But these, these will make a lot of difference to the performance by where we put them. And it's fairly obvious how why that's the case because we put the window out here, then heat can transmit through the wall here and out um, much more easily than if it's in insulation. And if you remember this formula, it's this installed value, this side value of the installation the length of the installation that is really critical to uh, the performance of our window. So let's have a look at this. This is an example actually of the Passivaz Institute, but it doesn't really matter. Putting a nice 0.8 U-value window, triple glazed window, uh, into a, actually a typically German wall, a masonry wall, uh, insulating on the outside, but putting the window back where it was before it was insulated. So we've got a nice window of the 0.8 U-value, that's a good quality window. We've got a I know a terrible psi value there um, because we've got a huge amount of heat loss here. And if our installed U value is 1.84. And for a one meter square window, it would depend on the size of the window. But, um, and obviously what we've done is taken a really good triple glazed window and we've, we've taken it down to a very modest double glazed window in effect in performance just by where we've put it. If we move that to into the uh, insulation layer and we then model the side value, it's actually can we come down to zero. So our 0.8 value window when installed, the installed value is still 0.8. So we're, we're gaining the value of that window. And if we go back to this example we looked at a moment ago, uh, of the two examples of the two types of the, the one window with a lot of detail in it, and then we install that badly as well. We can now be some, somewhere like 1.8, that window. So again, you know, just the way we, we install can make a huge difference. And then if we look at the detailing as well at the window, those two, those two lessons are really significant in retrofit. And here's an example, and I'm going to just hand this over to Bill. Um, this is where we cut our teeth really in the Denbydale Passive House. Yep. So back to new build, but this is where we started getting, you know, practical experience with film forms of positioning of windows. Remember that at Denby Dale, this was the first time, um, well, one of the first passive houses in the country, and certainly it was the first cavity wall full fill um, passive house. So we... Uh, we knew that windows perform best in the middle of the insulation, um, which are remembering what Chris has just talked about. We've got to actually hold that window out in that position, in the middle of insulation. We've got to minimize the thermal bridging again, which we've just been talking about. Um, we've got to have air tightness, which we'll look at. And we've also got to have wind tightness and obviously weather proofing outside as well. So we had a particular problem with putting them into cavity wall. So um, next slide, please. So um, this was our first go at it. In fact, Bob Lowe talked about um, ply boxes for a project we did in 1991 back in um, at Longwood in Huddersfield for a low energy house. And we're still, we're still learning, Bill, now, aren't we? And we're still learning now, <laughs> yeah. So that was, um, pardon me, that was our first uh, attempt at a ply box to hold the window out in, in the insulation. Now we use this with retrofit as well, you know, with timber frame or, or masonry for various reasons, because structurally it will hold a window out from, uh, uh, the inner leaf in this case. Um, it's also airtight, 18 mil plywood is airtight, so we can tape to it and then tape to the wall 
strategy inside, if it's an internal it. Um, uh, and what we're left with, though, is this problem, the bottom left-hand picture, look at the cavity wall insulation exposed. So we obviously can't have that. So <clears throat> what we developed, if you look at the next slide, is quite a convoluted. Right. Next slide. Yep, yep. Yep. Um, powder coated aluminium. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, which not only is quite complicated, but we actually, because our masonry wasn't exactly um, consistent, every window was slightly different as well. So we really made life difficult for ourselves. This is almost, well, this is 13 years ago now, 14 years. Uh, but the side value was a, a minus figure, which actually then feeds back into the, um, the energy demand of the whole house and is an advantage. So we then moved on. Um, next one. Uh, no, this is... I'll move straight on. So in, in this uh, example, you'll see that we've got, um, we've dealt with the structure of having the window in the middle of the insulation. We've got thermal bridge minimal minimization with that aluminium boxing with PU inside, uh, polyurethane. Air tightness is the uh, ply box and tapes uh, and wet plaster inside. Oh, sorry. And wind tightness is obviously dealt with by the aluminium capping. So with every window, you have to look at those four issues, basically. And one could even say that about a bell, bell wire going through a wall. Just have them in, um, you know, in, in, in your thoughts when doing any detailing. So if we just move on. Now, because of that expense, um, our latest passive house, this was in 2019, 2020 at Kurt Burton, we're using a more, um, a better performing, more expensive window, the one we do, which is a progression from the Czech Republic. And we moved it right out to the back of the masonry because we, uh, we wanted to make life simpler. So we've taken a hit on the side value, if you like, but we've got a better performing window. Um, but with value engineering, we, you know, we reckon this was better value engineering in the true sense, a lot simpler. So next slide. What we also knew, Bill, was that um, if we modelled it, we knew that it would meet what we described earlier, that the hygiene criteria either wouldn't be compensation anywhere, even though we had we had made the side value slightly. Well, that's because it's a regression window, which has, uh, has insulation. You can't see it very well. We should have blown it up on the outside of the frame, um, up against the uh, there. So it's integral with the window. So I forget what the actual side value was, actually. Should, should have had it written on this, shouldn't I? But anyway. Good, you failed again. Yeah. I failed again, yeah. <laughs> Move on to the next one. Right. Uh, so, a little bit of me, I think. Yeah, a little bit of you. Go on. Yeah, so um, just, um, it's mainly because I could just speak faster, that's all. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so air tightness principles, obviously Bill's talked about, but um, we need con continuity of air tightness, if possible, around the house. So we need to think about where that air tightness is all the way. Okay. Now, windows and doors obviously potentially compromise the air tightness of the fabric of the building because they're creating a gap in the building fabric so we need to take real care with that junction and that's the key thing with the windows uh, putting in some uh, expanding foam is not really sufficient we do need to do proper measures and bill was going to just go through some detail a bit more but we also need airtight windows and doors so if you are choosing uh, windows and doors um, you need to be looking to make sure that they have class 4 airtightness and really, if you're going to a good quality retrofit uh, or a new quality, quality new build, you really shouldn't be putting in anything less than class four. Um, I will say all of ours are class four, but uh, I would say that, wouldn't I? Um, and that's all independently tested. But I, I think, you know, there are plenty of windows with class four airtime, and you should be checking that, really. 
And another thing to look for, so something we make quite a lot of because we think it's very important, is having more than one draft seal. A lot of Windows O do only have one draft seal, even high performance windows, um, because one of the problems with putting two seals in generally is you get a slightly fatter window because you've got to literally step it twice um, to get two, two proper compression seals. You sometimes see a secondary uh, flipper type seal uh, where there's not a proper seal. Um, but two, the advantage of two compression seals is that your air tightness will be rust, robust over a longer period of time because in the end, um, seals can fail, they snag. If you've got two, you're much more likely to stay airtight for a much longer period of time. In, it, effectively, one airtight, one seal will give you the airtightness. So you can put one seal in the passive house, it will be fine at that level of performance, but it won't give you such great longevity. And I think longevity is something we don't think about. We think about the, the performance at the moment of building or the moment of retrofitting. So this is important, but we do have this deeper frame as a result generally. Um, and this slide is really just to show that we can mitigate that by the way we detail the window in, into the fabric uh, to get that sort of sense of sight line down slightly. Um, I think that's over to you, Bill. Okay, so it's uh, important not to get air tightness and wind tightness or weather tightness mixed up. They're two different things. Uh, air tightness might be um, an external strategy where you do an external wall insulation, where you're rendering the walls um, and taping into the windows. But air tightness is always on the warm side of the insulation. And that is to alleviate the risk of interstitial condensation within the fabric. Weather tightness, it tends to be a um, vapor open material where any moisture within the fabric, which might be there because of um, uh, rain, um, weather, or it might be there because there's moisture within the building from building works, for example. So they, they can be, they're usually tapes inside, which I'll show you a few of in a minute. Um, so weather tightness could be, as we are showing here, expanding tapes, but quite often is Commonly, it will be sealant, silicon. Um, we use burnt sand around here in, on the Pennines because we're, everything's built in stone and then that's uh, quite rough. Um, and um, anyway, next slide. So one of the tapes we use is this Contiga Solido SL which actually, and I don't know if you can see my, my screen here, I can't do this in the mirror. It's got tear off strips, sticky strips on the back um, and one extra one on the face. Um, so this is, we use this one particularly when we're pre-taping a window installation, where we tape the window before we offer it into the opening. And I think if we turn to the next slide, Chris, this is Andy. This is a new build, but actually um, we do the same in retrofit situations. But look at the corner. He's doing what's called a rabbit's ear. Can you just point at that, Chris? Uh, well, there's one here. No, back down. Come down to the other corner. At the bottom. Yeah. So, no, the other. Yeah, okay. We've pinched the, the tape. You see what I mean on the corner, like this. That takes up the um, the difference between the window size and the structural opening size. We always have at least a five mil gap all the way around the window if the structural opening is really square, which is unusual in retrofit. So we generally have a ten mil gap most of the way around the window when we measure up for surveying. Um, and then we can actually use this tape to actually plaster onto as well. So it's sort of a, a, a dual air tightness. And it's very adaptable, this tape. And we use an awful lot of it. You can see there that we're taping on the left-hand side from the ply box onto the block work, which will then have wet plaster. And that's our red line strategy that Chris was talking about. This has actually got plasterboard put on top of the on top of the tape 
so that they can wet plaster up to the aris at the corners. Next slide. So we then have the profil tape, which I call the, um, the post taping method, where we've installed the window and then we um, have, where are we? Yeah. Where we actually, if you go on to the next slide, there. So this tape has a 12 mil and a 50 mil two part uh, tear off strips. Remember, this tape is extremely sticky with acrylic glues um, and will stick to any surfaces as long as they're dust free and uh, uh, and dry, basically. So what we do is we take the four sides, don't go around the corner, and then we use, if you go to the next slide, Chris, these little corners, rather Blue Peter style. I've got one here that I made earlier. Can you see? So, yeah. And this means that you can cover up the tape with your, in this case, plasterboard or plywood reveal and window board. Really important because this glue is so good. If you get it on a pre-finished window, you can't get it off again. And the only way to, to uh, sort it out is either get a new window or take a chisel to it. Well, on a pre-finished window, that is, which is the most expensive part of the build. We don't want to be doing that. Next slide, please. So we're just going to talk about retrofit in principle here. So we've been through this already. Um, and by the way, with internal wall insulation, we don't go above a 0.35 U value uh, because we don't want to raise risks of um, interstitial condensation because we made the wall too cold, which makes, sounds a bit silly, but we've got to be worried about uh, timber floor joists particularly into walls if we're making them too cold. Um, I might say below below 0.35, Bill. Pardon? Say again. You might want to say below 3.35, above. Yes, I'm sorry, below. Using whether it yes. up and below, that's all. With external wall insulation, we're actually uh, taking the risk out of it. So we're actually making the wall warmer. And so we can put on far more. Uh, and we might be going into a U value of 0.15 or um, even down as, part, uh, as far as 0.1. So this is the inward and outward uh, window uh, strategy. Next slide, please. So here we have, this is our friend Gil Shalom down in Nottingham with a external wall insulation strategy on a, uh, a cavity wall. So this will be a, you know, a, a post Second World War house probably. Also, You've taken the risk out of moisture getting into the walls, so putting in um, a cavity fill as well. So, I mean, this is an excellent um, uh, uh, example. See how he's taken the window outside of the, uh, the existing wall here. Of course, that means that you've got different reveals to repair inside um, or make up in some way or the other. And, and to be quite honest, this is, uh, I think, a bit theoretical because we know that the reveals, if this is on plan, are returned with masonry. Yeah, normally. So uh, they've taken that brickwork out in the cavity. So there's quite a bit of work put into this detail. And next slide, please. And here we are with the progression window, which uh, we showed you earlier in the Kurt Burton masonry house. And that has an insulated box on integral with the frame. Yes, so that's, uh, I think it's PU, isn't it, in there? Um, or it can be cork. Uh, they do either. But importantly, look, the way that we're holding the window out is with that ply box, very similar to that Denby Dale detail earlier. 
uh, and look also that they've taken that brick return out of the, um, sorry, the brick return on, yeah, at that point there. Got to be very careful when doing that, by the way, because um, there may be structural issues, particularly with bigger window openings. Okay, next slide. So here we are, one on the left is, um, everybody's our friend, by the way. This is, um, um, I forgot his name for a minute. Come on, um, our mate in Sheffield. Come on. Oh, um, Paul Tester. Paul Tester, yeah. Wood fiber on the existing oh. look. Um, I don't know if he's got enough adhesive underneath that, that uh, wood fiber, actually. It should be. I, I would have said plastered up a bit more. But anyway, but you've got the principle there of an outward opening window system. The one on the right is our project at the um, at goodness me, me and names. What's it called? Um, Roy. Lower Royd in uh, Belton. It's yeah, only yeah. about a few hundred yards from my house here, where I'm speaking. So this is diathonite, which a lot of you will have heard about which is the ecological building uh, systems um, import from Italy. This is cork and lime. This was the evolution uh, uh, product, which is a, has a lambda value. Remember, lambda values are the thermal performance of any given material. So this one has a lambda value of 0.045, which is um, pretty good, but it's not brilliant. Same as a lot of wood fiber but it is capillary and vapor open um, and is beautiful as well and expensive, I might add. On later projects, we've used the uh, diatonite thermoactive, which has a lambda value of 0.037. Um, and so we don't, to get to the 0.35U value, we um, used 85 on later job millimeters of thickness. So hopefully, we can, uh, the windows are in check as they were on these two jobs. So we can take that same 85 mil round into the reveals. Next slide. Um, so a lot of retrofits and we do a lot of this sort of thing with a, a typical cavity wall construction. Uh, that, I mean, that internal wall insulation could be wood fiber. It could be um, PU actually. But be very, very careful when using PU because it's not vapor open. And it's uh, ideally one should be doing a woofy. Now, we have used PU quite a lot. In fact, um, we usually do, but we check with woofy that the calculation is right. Um, so in this case, look, we've got a cavity fill. And hopefully it's not like Tina's West Wall which he's had to take out because it's so wet, actually. So we're very careful. But the principles are there. Okay, the next slide. Uh, and this is a typical timber frame. This is a really good example of a solid timber window. So we can get the side value down quite far without going for an expensive insulated um, frame. Uh, by installing really well with that insulation in front of the inward opening window. Um, I, Joyce, TJ, Joyce, Timber Joyce are our friends in the passive house world because of their strength, their cheapness, relative cheapness, um, and particularly because of their thermal bridging detail because it's just a nine mil hard board web. Next slide. Uh, and again, look, here's another example for another job. Oh, and by the way, the, uh, we use these aluminium sills a lot. These are sort of off the shelf, uh, made by Goodman, uh, of varying widths. It um, overcomes a lot of our problems, particularly with external wall insulation. Uh, and we've got different, um, end caps, one for uh, render, for example, but stop short, um, uh, and these for other details. Um, next slide. Am I talking as quick as you, Chris? I don't think I am. am I? Right. You, never, you never talk as quick as me. Yeah. <laughs> There's a nice example of a CLT. I think it's maybe up in Cumbria, actually. 
um, CLT, cross laminated timber, which is big slabs of um, IKEA butcher block or work dock type uh, structures, which comes in a, uh, you know, on the back of a lorry and is craned in. Very quick, um, very um, easy in a way to make airtight because it'll be external insulate. So they'll uh, airtight a strategy. So there'll be a membrane put on top of this. But look at the ply boxes again, where we're bringing the windows right out into whatever the strategy is going to be. So that could be eye joists again, could be last and trusses, or it could be wood fiber. I don't know what they ended up doing actually. Oh, it is wood fiber. Wood fiber piled on the roof. Yes, so it must be a wood fiber. Um, but yeah, good example of uh, fly boxes. Next one, please. Ah, right, yeah, compact foam. We use this a lot, and of course we sell this as well. Uh, Chris brought this in from Austria many years ago now. How many years ago? So it's a structural polystyrene. Yeah. Uh, and we use it in thresholds and for holding windows out in, uh, you know, with the EWI external wall insulation strategies. So it's structurally sound, so you, you know, saw it, screw into it, treat it like timber, but it has a lambda value of, I think, of 0.047, which is pretty good. Um, and we developed this on the gold capacitive house, actually, where we cast it into the edge of the slab. This detail has been copied many times uh, since, and we are selling an awful lot of this now. Um, I'm really proud of this detail. It just gets you around the problem of how you put the doors in, particularly, doesn't it? In terms yes. of the thermal yes. at the edge of a slab, because we had to we had to invent a system for the demo yeah. because there was nothing nothing available. So this solved our problem. Um, yes, it uh, did. I'm going to say um, to keep Tina happy, we probably need to get through in about another five minutes. So, go yeah, right, I'll keep yeah. going. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, not only with um, doors though, but um, big uh, full height glazing systems, um, which need to be supported. Uh, here we are with the Isoquick system. This is new build, obviously. Again, the Isoquick is a raft of EP um, S polystyrene. So next slide, please. Sorry, um, we're jumping in, that's it. Yeah. Right, so, right, let's talk about what decisions one takes with retrofit. So are we going to, uh, are we leaving the existing windows in or replacing um, EWI or IWI, uh, IWI internal or external, and particularly the sequencing of the retrofit works. Is this a step-by-step -step approach? Really important where the windows are going and your choice of windows about your whole house strategy. Next slide. So if you're replacing, all right, um, it's a lot easier to ensure continuity of insulation, okay? Um, is, and the positioning of the windows is really important. Now, particularly with cavity wall, um, um, uh, housing uh, buildings, you'll have a vertical downproof course already in there. So actually you probably end up with the windows in the same position as the existing. Um, so um, what we ha have, if you're keeping the existing windows, um, you'll probably end up with, with internal wall insulation with a quite a thin area on the reveal to be able to put insulation. So we can end up with using um, this aerial space blanket. Have you seen this? It's uh, got a lambda value of 0.015 and is really useful in retrofit, where you don't want to lose too much of the light by having thicker frames. Okay, it's also vapor open. And if you want to be really extreme, you can go for the bits, which is the vacuum insulated panels, a bit like coffee pack, you get down at Morrison's, but full of silicon and then uh, a vacuum. This has a lambda value of down at 0.007, three times as good as polyurethane, but expensive. Next slide. Uh, to ensure continuity of insulation, the windows doors must ideally be, ideally placed with the insulation. I think we've done that already. Uh, 
that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And probably that, have we? Probably that as well, sequencing. Yeah. But again, I think if you're going for external wall insulation later from replacing your windows, you've got the question, do you put the windows further out at the face of the wall so they can get covered up by the external wall insulation later? And if you do that, that then has uh, implications on the weather tightness in the intermediate time of leaving it there. It's very exposed if you put the window further out. You've also obviously got to um, repair the reveals inside. And you may go beyond the DPC, actually, if you take your windows right out. So all got to be taken into consideration. OK, next slide. Uh, some people have done, this is a Charlie Baker job in, um, in, in Manchester, a retrofit. Um, and he's got the ply box look, but he's actually made a feature of it with birch ply, I think, maybe birch ply. Um, and he um, was going to do external wall insulation later and take the windows out later with the external wall insulation, which is quite a neat way of doing it, actually. Mm. Next slide. Uh, I wonder if we should just pick one of these. You know, um, and shut up. Yes. All right. Oh, just to allow questions. <laughs> go on, move. Right, let's go. There you go for come. This, this is right. This is come work. This is the VIPs. All right, where we've got actually existing triple glaze windows that we put into the house five years previously, um, and they're very small with not much light. We certainly weren't going to thicken up the window frame so we ended up with 10 mil vips which becomes part of the airtight strategy next slide oh, there we are. not many of these no. here we are at uh, lower roid with the um uh, uh, the first coats of diethanite next slide oh, which is airtight as well by the way nice thing with the diethanite you can get nice rounded arises which goes well with certain period uh, retrofits or conversions. Next slide. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, already. Next slide. And on the same job, you see, you can have external and internal. And that quite often happens with retrofit, inward and outward opening windows. Next slide. Um, there we are with using the compact foam. Quite often we just use it at the bottom and use brackets up the side. Um, just some, uh, haven't got a bracket. Anyway, next slide. Uh, different examples of external wall insulation. There's a top left is ply box look. Uh, the bottom we've got where we brought it out to the front of the wall and then covered the frame up with the EWI. Um, yeah, next slide. And here we have, this is in Huddersfield, actually. Yeah, ply boxes again, bringing the windows out for, uh, I think this was EPS, external wall insulation. Next slide, we're nearly there. Oh, I yeah. think we'll, we'll just jump this in one minute and just, we were gonna just tell you a little bit about what we do and it's very brief, just really, we, we do a range of windows. I think that's all I'm going to say. Um, and there's some examples here. Um, so we've got a chance for discussion. Uh, this, this is the progression window that Bill was talking about. It's a premium passive house window uh, in the right circumstance. It can be spot on, in terms of giving that frameless look, uh, such as this here. It's a Kirsty Maguire job, I think, isn't it? And this is our Kurt Burton passive house where and you literally can't see the frame. So, but, uh, it, so in fact, the solar gain's so much better in those. Which we remember you're going back to the frame size. If you've got a narrow frame, and this is a very narrow frame, um, then uh, just going back there, this is actually only eight, 80 millimetres, I think, from memory across here. Um, buried in the yeah. wall, very nice detail, but um, only in the right projects, really. Um, we got to try and offer a lot of uh, technical support because we think retrofit is complicated and, and, and energy efficiency is complicated, and we need to support you in doing that. So we do the best we can to give technical, technical advice. And we you building to Passive House or retrofitting to Passive House, uh, PHBP ready data as well. Um, yeah, but we found in 1995, we've done lots of stuff, basically. You can look us up on the website. Yeah. Uh, we did win the Queen's Award for Sustainable Enterprise. In and we've got suits on us, look. Now, that hasn't happened for a long time. I don't think I can find that suit now. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I know where it is. Um, and we do a range of uh, Windows, MDHR, Airtimes products, consultancy training, really. So uh, everything to do with the fabric of the building, making it work, really. Um, and we are now part of a larger group of companies uh, with Green Building Renewables, who do heat pumps and renewables, and Coda, who are commercial consulting. And our aim, uh, as you say, is taking the lead in the UK's transformation to efficient, sustainable buildings, which uh, I like as a, uh, an ambition. Uh, and that's us. And I've put the, uh, the webinar, if you're interested, tomorrow night here. It's seven till eight tomorrow night, hosted by Insulate Britain. Uh, and you can find it on the, at that URL there. And we're open to questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was, uh, that was a really great uh, romp through everything about Windows, I think. And, and really useful to see those diagrams where the, the heat escaping around the sides and where to put your windows, which I think many builders haven't really um, thought about yet. So that's quite a new idea for lots of builders. Could I say, Tina, that uh, the, our website, Green Building Store website, has got a lot of free resources on it? Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, Chris and I are here more than commercially, if you like. We want to further good building practices. Mm -hmm. So all of our projects, we blog and write about, which, of course, feeds back into uh, good consultancy and so forth. So, we, we you know, you can read warts and all about our failures, which are, in fact, are more important than the, the successes, to be quite honest. Mm -hmm. You know, particularly yeah. around air tightness, for example. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so th but the best people to talk to about air tightness are the people who've been doing it, yes. and and learning from what they've done over a number of years than someone who's just turned up and started having a go. Um, so yes, it's really useful to to benefit from other people's mistakes and and learn from all of those. Uh, different ways of doing things and, and find out what, what really works and, and then you know to share that more widely. So yeah, that sounds a really good idea. And those case studies, you know, you they're really useful to see, you know, you, you go and find the one that's the nearest to your house and it will give you a real sense of the kind of approaches that you might want to consider and ways that you might want to look at doing things. We did do a project some years ago for Warmer Homes for uh, our transition movement at the time here quite a few years ago and that you know if you're struggling with a existing house and not knowing how far you can go we looked at various steps for hard to treat buildings so also our case studies are mostly about really deep retrofit um, but those are a little bit you know well how far do I go can I only afford a you know a sausage dog to go under the door or can I afford to, you know and what, what are the sensible steps so that that's worth looking at that's on our website the other thing I'd say is it's when you are considering your retrofit, it is really difficult to know how far to go. You know, I think, how much do I insulate? Yes, you know, the you don't want to do IWI more than that 0.35 U rally, but you know, how far do I go really? How, and I, I would again flag up that webinar actually, because yeah. uh, Andy yeah. Sims will be looking at that um, and really try, I mean, he's not gonna give all the answers clearly because nobody has all the answers, but it's the, at the moment, it's the biggest question. The retrofit, I'd say, is how far do we need to go in this country? How, you know, what sort of house do we insulate to what standards? So it's a really open question. And if you're wrestling with it, you are like most people working in retrofit in this country at the moment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And one thing I would say to add on to that is, is that is why it, CAFS offers a, an energy um, model and a report because it's really a decision making tool. So our home retrofit planner software that we use models the house right now as it is and then we can talk about different scenarios from your light touch um the cheapest most sensible easy wins through to perhaps what a middle of the road option through to the the sort of more ambitious end of the scale and we can tailor that to exactly what our clients want so we ask about the priorities we go through the kind of things that they're considering and put them into these different scenarios and then you can see once you run the three scenarios you can then compare them and you can compare them with different uh, you know we expect a certain amount of temperature change we expect people to be living in a warm home not a cold home once they've finished and you can see what's going to happen to your energy bill approximately and you can you can get a sense of the 
the options and the difference it'll make and which things make sense and which things perhaps don't. Mm. And then you can also factor in, well, I'm, I want this for comfort, not because it's going to save me a lot of energy necessarily, or I want this because it gives me good air quality or whatever it is. So you can build in your priorities, but it helps to make those decisions. So um, yeah, that's a more sort of specific to, to the individual home yeah. um, option, but it's really good to have that background understanding and understand the general topic um, before you go into that really. That's great. Well, in that case, we've had no more questions come in and we're, we're just about on time. So I'm going to um, bring up my presentation again and finish that finish off there. Let me just try and do that. OK. So. There we go. Well, thank you so much, Bill and Chris, for um, for the presentation and also for answering um, those questions. And questions are never simple with Windows, are they? So thank you so much for answering the questions. Um, if anyone thinks of further questions after today, then either get in touch with CAFS. We can we can do we'll answer what we can. Um, either through our advice calls or retrofit consultation call or even our full energy advice audits um, so you can get in touch with us there if you're if you're obviously looking at windows and and want to talk to green building store you know where they are um, as well and one thing i would say is to keep an eye out for our future webinars We've got one in April on the retrofit journey for householders. So that covers the whole of the retrofit journey and the things you might want to think about before you embark on a retrofit. Uh, we've also got introduction to construction contracts, which is a, a really key part once you've decided what you're doing, um, who are you going to get to do it and how do you get a good contract set up to help you um, go about that. For, for your builders and perhaps any anyone who's thinking of doing their own retrofit work themselves as uh, very hands-on then we're going to have a series of webinars coming up in um, April May June time with a workshop on the 10th of May uh, with some demos there and for those who might be interested in the broader topic then we have our climate and carbon literacy training sessions to look out for um, and what I would say is do sign up to our newsletter if you haven't already done so, because then you get the reminders for all the webinars, uh, especially when we put new ones on, we'll bring them to your attention. And we have a new Facebook group, Cumbria Green Build, with the link there. So if you're wanting to chat to others who might be looking at retrofit as well, and then, you know, there's a bit of a community there we hope to build up over time. So really, I think we're going to wrap up yeah, almost exactly on time. So just as a reminder, um, sign up to the newsletter, come along to another webinar. Um, when I email out after this webinar, probably tomorrow or later in the week, you'll get an email with the link to the webinar. You'll also get a link for our survey. If you haven't already done our household survey, please do it. It's just it, it can be anonymous. We just like to get your views. Um, so that will be there in the email. And do get in touch with us if we can help with anything. Thank you very much to those of you who've donated to us when you've um, booked onto one of these webinars. And just to wrap up, I'd like to say a really big thank you again to Bill and to Chris for um, sharing your expertise with us and uh, giving us a, a look at all those fascinating case studies uh, really impressive and um you know exciting case studies showing what is possible in in building you know the the sort of the gold standard um some of those projects represent so thank you so much for for that and thank you to everyone who's taken part today thank you for your questions and we hope to see you again at another webinar uh, before too long thank you